Yeah, I'll take off the name tag. To the trash can. Uh, hello, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me well? Uh, thank you for joining us this night for for our event here in San Mateo and thank you everyone for joining us online. I know this time there is so so many of you. Hello. <laughs> uh, my name is Marina Gear. I'm part of the team here at Silicon Valley Innovation Center, the company that is hosting this event tonight. Apart from speaker series events, we organize executive trainings. Hello, good evening everyone. Good evening Marina. <laughs> like the worst experience ever. <laughs> uh, apart from speaker series events, uh, we organize executive trainings, programs for new product development and educational programs in disruptive technology trends. If you or someone you know is interested uh, to participate in any of our programs, please come uh, talk with me or my colleagues here. And tonight, uh, we are having a fantastic guest speaker, Neil Patel. Uh, Neil is a real growth and metrics guru, which all of you probably already know since you're here. Neil is the co-founder of Crazy Egg and analytics software, his metrics and analytics platform, and Quick Sprout, a growth hacking blog. And now the official part. Uh, the Wall Street Journal calls him a top influencer on the web. Forbes says he's one of the top 10 online marketers. President Obama recognizes him as a top 100 entrepreneur under the age of 30, and the United Nations as one of the top 100 entrepreneurs under the age of 5. Apart from all that, Neil is a to such publications as TechCrunch, Mashable, uh, Business Insider, GeekWire, and many other. And today he's eager to share some of his knowledge with us. And uh, now, with great pleasure, I'm giving it to Neil. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Awesome. So today, I'm going to teach you guys how to build a blog, company blog more specifically, that hits hundreds and thousands of visitors a month. You guys ready? Yeah. All right, let's get started. Here's my Twitter handle. You can use that hashtag. If they have a hashtag here, you can use that as well. Um, I've been doing business for over 10 years, and there's one commonality between how each of my businesses grew. Can you guess how I grew each of them? It was through content marketing. That one channel has always been converting for me. It converted 10 years ago. It converts still today. It's my most profitable channel, and it's by far the most lucrative because you can get a lot of value from it. Now, I love starting with this quote. It's from Rand Fishkin. There's no black magic to successfully attracting customers via the web. When a lot of people are trying to build up their audience, they constantly are looking for that trick. Hey, what's this hack that I can do to get more traffic? Do you know any tricks? Do you know any tips? What's one way I can generate millions of visitors in the next 30 to 60 days? Sadly, unless you have a lot of money, there really is no tricks. With a lot of hard work, and using the strategies that I have, you can succeed. But it's not going to be in a month where you're going to see results. It easily takes three to six months, if not a year. But within that time frame, I guarantee blogging will not only be a great channel for you, but it will also be profitable. So there's a few things that you need to know before you start. One, who are your customers? Two, where do they hang out? And three, how should you engage with them? Right? If you don't know who your customers are, you don't know where they hang out or how to engage with them, what's going to end up happening is you're going to end up creating a blog, you're going to target the wrong people, engage on the wrong channels, and you're going to try to drive thousands of visitors to a site, and none of those visitors will end up converting. 
And visitors may sound like a great metric, but if you can't convert any of those people into customers, does it really matter? No, right? I wish the world worked with just, you know, more traffic you get, the more money you're worth. I actually feel like the Snapchats of the world it is, but for the majority of us, it's not, right? So I'm going to give you an example of KISS metrics and how we do it. And I'm also going to give you examples of how you can replicate it. So with us, we target online marketers, right? Here's some examples from Sean Ellis to me to Jeremy Shoemaker. We're all on websites. That is our customer that KISS metrics. If we didn't target online marketers and we just targeted people with websites, what we found, and we did do this at the beginning, right? Because just like most entrepreneurs, we all make mistakes. And I used to go out there and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to get so many people coming to my website. I'm going to get all this traffic, all these business owners. Then they'll come to the side and none of them convert. And I was like, why? And these well, we kind of don't get what you do. We're just trying to figure out how to pay our bills and just keep it growing. You know, we have other people to figure that out. If you don't get very specific, you're not going to end up converting. More specifically for us, it's not just online marketers with websites. It's online marketers who have an e-commerce website. That's how specific we get. When we focus that nitty-gritty right with our marketing and we create content that's targeted towards e-commerce owners, SaaS owners, etc., we found that our numbers skyrocket. Our traffic numbers don't, but our conversion revenue numbers do. In essence, you need to sell to zebras, right? If someone looks like a zebra, they walk like a zebra. I don't know what sounds a zebra makes. I know what sounds as donkeys make. But, you know, let's assume they make some sounds. If you target zebras and your customers are zebras, you're fine. The moment you target a lion when your customers are zebras, nothing really pleasant is going to happen. The lion may say, yeah, 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 we can potentially be your customer. They'll eat all your zebras. But they're not going to sign up and pay you any money. So you got to really get down to who your ideal customer is. When you're doing all of this, you need a measure. Without measuring, you're not going to end up figuring out how to monetize, right? With us, we found that a lot of our customers are on Twitter. So we started going on Twitter, tweeting, responding to people who had questions about analytics. We were starting to generate traffic and some customers from it. It wasn't too bad, right? We did over 24,000 tweets. We have over 200,000 followers, and we spent zero dollars. It's just our time, right? My co-founder, every Saturday, schedules up a shit ton of tweets. And that's what he does. And during the weekdays, he'll respond to some and participate. And people are like, wow, you guys are really active. And we are, but it takes time, right? And although Twitter was a good channel, we thought it was going to be our number one channel, it isn't by any means. Our number one channel is our blog. And I love reading this quote from Chris Brogan. And he says, no matter what, the very first piece of social media real estate that I would start with is a blog. And Chris Brogan himself writes books on Google Plus and Twitter and Facebook. But yet he's still saying a blog is the best channel. And the data we have actually backs that up as well. So let's get started. How many of you here have a blog? All right, are you on WordPress? Good. Kind of? The kind of? You can't be kind of. Yeah, I don't know how. It's like, yeah, we're half WordPress and the half movable type. That doesn't really work, right? Hopefully you're not on Tumblr or Blogger. Blogger's the worst. Uh, but yeah, as long as you're on WordPress, you're fine. The reason I say WordPress is we're all startups. And as a startup, I'm assuming all you guys are startups, right? As startups, spend money on development. And I don't know if it's just you, but I don't care how technical you are. I haven't figured out a way to make development move fast. If they say it's moving fast, it can still be moving faster. With WordPress, it's a community. They have open source. People build on WordPress, and you can get stuff for free. Where could you beat that? All you have to do is just Google XYZ plugin, and you'll find it. For that reason, you should be on WordPress. Now, once you're on WordPress, the first step is to create content. But you can't just create any content. You have to create content that educates, that teaches. So when I started blogging, I was like, yeah, I want people to sign up. My first blog was a blog that taught marketing. It was called Prona Advertising. It hit in the Technorati 100. Uh, and at that time, Technorati was a blog search engine and it ranked top blogs. Now Technorati, I think, is dead. But nonetheless, you know, the site still exists. 
Now, when I was blogging, the, some of the first blog posts I wrote, and again, as I mentioned, the blog post doesn't, or blog doesn't exist anymore, but the first few blog posts I wrote, how we are an awesome company and people should sign up. At that time, I wasn't even in the Tech Ready 1 million, right? Can you guess how many customers we got? None. I even threw paid advertising at that. I'm like, oh, yeah, if I get traffic to these blog posts, people are going to read it, and they're going to read how we're an awesome company, and then they're going to sign up. Keep in mind, I wasn't even 21 at the time, and I was young and naive. It didn't work. But when I started writing content that educated, and I linked out to whoever was giving the best information, even if they were my competitors, any sounds, I started generating clients from them. So I was like, what the heck is this? I'm giving away free information, and I'm teaching you how to do it all without paying me a dollar, yet people are still hitting me up and saying, yeah, we'll pay you to do that, when you could just go hire an intern and just do it yourself. I was shocked. By writing content that teaches, yes, you're going to get a portion of people who will do stuff on their own. But you have to keep in mind, humans are inherently lazy. We really are. Why not leverage it? Give away the whole farm. Someone's going to give it away. It's just a question of when. So might as well have it be you. You'll get the notoriety, the press for it, and you'll gain customers from it. Now, when you're doing this, you have to be consistently awesome, just like a kid. You know when a kid plays, have you ever noticed they keep being crazy? doesn't matter how much sugar or non-sugar you give them, they're still crazy. In their eyes, they're awesome, no matter what. They're always also right, no matter what. That's a whole different story, though. Now, when you're writing content, your content has to be great. It's just like that kid. You know, when you were a kid and you would play, you wouldn't. You wouldn't actually go out there and play a bit and be like, oh, okay, right, I'm going to play my bike and do nothing and sit on the grass. When you're a kid, you're going to go crazy every single day and just go all out, right? Your parents may get mad at you for getting dirty or whatever it is, but you play hard. And that's the same thing. When you're blogging, you need to be consistent. If you're going to write a post, write continually. If you're going to write once a week, you better write once a week. I don't care if it's a holiday. I don't care if you're sick. If you're going to do once a month, then stick to once a month. Worst case, you should stick to once a month, and then if you have more time, ramp it up to twice a month, then once a week, etc. I got lazy one time with my current blog, Clicksprout, years ago, and I took a whole month off. My traffic was climbing almost every single month prior to that. When I took a month off, how many months do you think it took for me to recover that traffic? Three. I had a blog consistently every week for three months, recuperate my traffic back to where it was versus it growing on a consistent basis. Now, sure, the blog won't ever go to zero, but it does go down. So by continually adding more information, you're going to find growth. When you're also doing this, you need to create a conversation, right? So how many of you here went to college? Cool. How many of you went uh, to local college, Berkeley, Stanford, one of those? Doesn't matter, but a lot of you, no matter what college you went to, you probably got bored in one of your classes. I know I did. I loved college because I got some of the best naps that I ever had in my life during college. I really did. I was looking forward to it. I'm like, astrology class, yes. <laughs> I got an hour. Right? I hated those labs because they wanted you to do work. You couldn't really sleep in those. But college put me to sleep. The reason being is the teacher spoke in monotone. There was no conversation. All he would do is lecture. It's kind of like an essay. Do you remember when you were in high school and the teacher teaches you how to write an essay? Same with college. Like, here's how you do action and your thesis, etc. And you write in monotone. It's just boring, right? And it's actually funny. The re reason you fall asleep is because there's no conversation. Well, in blogging, you can use the words you and I. It helps create a conversation, right? It creates that illusion. So if you read my content on ClickSprout, you'll notice a lot of you's and I's. It helps pe keep people engaged, makes them scroll longer, stay on the page, etc. comment, right? In essence, I'm creating a virtual conversation. And I kid you not, it works. The other thing is don't act smart when you blog. Dumb it down. And it's funny, the reason I asked who went to Stanford or Harvard or any of those types of colleges those people actually have a harder time blogging. The reason being is our vocabulary is typically better than the average person, right? 
they're more educated. They probably read more books, whatever it may be. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Well, actually, I am. In blogging, it's a bad thing because they're using all these words that people don't understand. If you read my content, I'm writing so a fifth grader can really understand my blog titles, right? I was reading TechCrunch the other day, and they used two words in a blog about what they were. And I was like, this blog post is not going to do well. And it didn't. I checked a day later, and it didn't get any social shares. Can you guess why? What was wrong with their title? They used two fancy words that people probably had to look up. Why would you want to do that? Isn't your whole purpose to have people read? Now, don't get me wrong. Most of you in here probably wouldn't have to look up those words, which is fine. But the average person, someone who lives in the boonies, who doesn't have an education, who still is interested in starting up a company, who reads TechCrunch, may not understand all the words that they're putting within their blog post. So not only should you create a conversation by using you and I, keep it simple. Don't try to be more sophisticated or smarter than your readers. You need them as much as they need you. You actually may even need them more, right? So be friendly with them. Once you got the conversation piece down, you need to focus on headings, right? So you see headings within your blog post. You need to use them three to five times. This will help you break it up. It keeps it simple, right? Just like your blog post. You don't want more than five to six words per par or lines per paragraph because it's just too long and it makes it harder to read. The headings like H3, H2, etc. doesn't matter which ones you use for SEO. The way Google works is the larger the font size, typically the more weight they give it, more weight because they're larger in font size, right? So just like a book, chapter titles, sub chapters, etc., you use headings to break up the sections of your body. You also want long blog posts. Don't just keyword stuff and write extra text just for the sake of it, but typically blog posts that are 2,000 words or more rank on the first page of Google. When they did the average out, SERP IQ did the study, they found that the average web page on page one of Google has at least 2,000 words. The average web page that ranks on the top three or four spots has 2,400 words. So content really is king. You also want to wrap it up with the conclusion. Your conclusion is to summarize a post. The reason you do this is not because your readers are dumb and you're like, oh, you know, they won't understand, so let me give them a conclusion. It's because scrolling patterns show that when someone visits a web page, one of the first things they do is scroll down to the bottom and then they check out some text or they may read a bit and then they scroll back up if they like it. Hence, you want to do a conclusion that covers what the main things that they'll learn. So then that way, hopefully they'll scroll back up and read, right? Now, once you do all of this, you need to focus on the headline or title of your blog post. But the thing is, most people don't always read headlines, right? You're lucky if you get people to read your headlines, assuming you have a catchy one. Can you guess? How many people actually read a headline? It's rare that even half the people will read your headline. If you have a good headline, 8 out of 10 people will read the headline. Now, out of the 8 out of 10, guess what the drop-off rate is for them to actually read the blog post? It's 2 out of 10. You're talking about 25% of the people that read the headline are actually going to read your content. Now, just think about yourself. How many of you here read TechCrunch? A lot of you. How many of you just look at the headlines? All right, good amount. How many of you actually just read the content? Some of you. Whoever raised your hand, you're lying. Don't act smarter than you are. You know you're not. <laughs> I'm kidding. So keep in mind, most people read content. Your headline has to be attractive. It's what pulls people in. So here are some general rubrics when creating a headline. One, numbers and negative words increase your CTRs, click-through rates, right? So try to use numbers and actually odd numbers. I think there's a point. Yeah, there you go. Number four, odd numbers work better than even ones. You also want to keep your characters under 65 uh, or the title under 65 characters for search engines. If you do a search, you'll realize that, hey, after 65 characters, you see that dot, dot, dot. You don't want your website to have the dot, dot, dot. You want the full text there. You also want to make your headline match the content. I've actually done this where I've created really viral headlines. And then I figured out that my bounce rate was really high. And I was like, why? And then I was like, oh, yeah, I'm just duping people into clicking my reading my headline. It doesn't work well, right? It has to match. Aim for six-worded headlines. Found that six words tends to produce the best results from a social media perspective. 
also want to avoid using words for multiple meanings, right? Some words mean different things in different languages, actually even in English. Just stick with simple words. You also want to use power, uh, power words or adjectives. And here's some examples, right? Like effortless, incredible, strange, unique. All of these interesting adjectives help drive more clicks. Don't believe me? Just look at Upworthy and BuzzFeed. They get so much traffic just because of their words, right? And it's just like, it's crazy. Like, they'll use titles. Like, this girl got paralyzed in a wheelchair. And what she did next will shock you. And I'm like, what does she do next? Did she walk? <laughs> right? And then I click on it, and she didn't walk. And I was like, what the hell? They made me click. And not just that, I watched a five-minute video on top of that, right? <laughs> but these damn power words and adjectives, they get you. So here's an example headline. Five shocking facts that will change your entire approach to social media. Now, how do you think I did with that headline? What do you think? Too long? All right. Some of you guys are paying attention. Good job. What else? That's a odd number. It's good. All right. So here's the thing, right? Too long, and I use more than six words. Now, does that mean I would create a bad headline? That's correct. I did not create a bad headline. It's maybe not the best headline, but it's a pretty good headline. You're not going to meet all these criteria all the time. And that's okay, right? No one's perfect. Nothing in the world is perfect. If you think something's perfect, go look at Picasso, right? Probably the paintings, like you see something, you're like, oh, this is perfect. There's probably like some errors in there, and the dude's like, oh, no one's going to know. You know, he just fills them in. It's like, just like, look at barbers and hairdressers. They butcher haircuts and like, oh, no, no, right? Nothing in the world is perfect. It's okay. If you meet most of them, you're good. Just follow the seven. When you're also blogging, you need to realize that no man's an island or no woman's an island. When someone leaves a comment, you got to respond. If you don't respond, you're just a jerk. <laughs> you really are, right? If someone took two minutes to write a comment, that means they probably spent five minutes reading your post. Hopefully they did. Sometimes you'll get those comments where people don't even read your posts. Those suck. But don't worry. There won't be too many of them. Now, when you're doing that, and if you respond, you build that loyalty. And people are like, wow, awesome. I love him. Like, I want to check out his products. I get so many of those emails. Why? Because I respond to comments. I've gotten companies to sign up like Air Canada. who's like, hey, Kissmetrics, here's a 50 grand check or a 100 grand check. And we're like, why? We're like, it's really good. So your product might well, we're just ready to go. And I'm like, really? Like, yeah, we've been reading your blog forever. You respond, you know, you respond to me when I write comments. I was like, this is awesome. Yes, I do respond, right? Did I know who you was? Sadly, no. I get a lot of comments. But, you know, it made his day. It made mine, too. I'm like, this is the easiest sale ever. How can I get, like, 100 of these a day, right? <laughs> Could have figured that out, but I'm still working on it. I'll let you know. Respond. It works wonders for you. Now, when you're blogging and you're responding to comments and you want more of these, there's a few things you need to know. One, ask a question at the end of your blog post. If you don't ask a question, why should someone take the time to respond with something, right? If you ask someone a question, there's a higher chance that you're actually going to get a comment. It's simple, but it works. Write in a conversational tone, which we discussed earlier, and respond to comments, which we discussed on the previous slide, right? So here's some examples on how we grew Kissmetrics. Uh, I think month of December, we had 814,582,000 ,000 visitors in total. We got it from 61 infographics, 1,056 blog posts, and over 40,000 comments. It's not too shabby. Here's examples of some infographics. They still work well. This is how Mint grew. Remember that company that got acquired by Intuit that everyone here used to use but doesn't use anymore? Because Intuit probably acquired them because they didn't want to have some startup take away their core you know, $19 billion business. But nonetheless, they grew through infographics. We do the same thing on Clickspread. I publish one every Friday, like clockwork. It's the best type of content. Why? I get so many backlinks from this, and my Google traffic just keeps going up month over month. Now, these infographics have to be related. Here's a good example. Analytics, metrics company, right? How colors affect purchases. That's related. Someone wants to know how to fine tune their website, is usually interested in metrics and numbers and data. Over 5,000 tweets, 6,000 likes, and one radio show interview, right? It was by Fortune or Forbes or one of those radio shows. 
I know their magazines, their radio show is probably not popular, but hey, I'll take whatever I can get. Here's another one, bounce rate demystified. You know all those people like, yeah, my bounce rate is like through the roof. And have you ever asked them? Hey, hey, that's crazy, yeah. Oh, by the way, what's your, what is a bounce rate? And then they just brush over the topic, right? Why? Because they have no clue what a bounce rate is. Heck, I didn't even really know what a bounce rate was, and I'm the founder of two analytics companies, right? <laughs> I had some engineer create an equation for me because I didn't know how to calculate a bounce rate. <laughs> but I created an infographic out of it, and I got over 2,000 tweets from it. <laughs> so I'll take all the credit in the world for it. And 600 likes and 300 LinkedIn shares. Here's another one. What makes someone leave your website? Same thing. A lot of traction, right? It's related to our company. It's funny. I saw a dentist company years ago creating infographics on computers. Not the smartest thing. Yes, you're going to get backlinks, but Google's probably going to penalize you, and you're not going to get any customers from it. Has to be relevant. If it's not relevant, don't waste your time. So here's some infographic tips. One, keep them visual. Limit the word count. Infographics are a way to make complicated data easy to understand. And you do that through images. Think of a kid. Kids love images. They don't want to read. They don't want to look at all the data. They just want images that tell a story. Two, make everything easy to understand. Your infographic's useless. Three, have five to six main points. What I mean by this is if you're talking about how colors affect conversions or purchases, one point could be the meaning of colors, right? how men and women view colors differently, like pink means this to women, pink means this to men, etc. That could be one point in that infographics. Another one could be how different colors, uh, how different call to action colors affect purchases, right? So th that's another point. And you can do around six of these. If you have more than that, it's just information overload. If you have less than that, it's like, hey, you're skimping on the information. I don't want this shitty infographic. Give me something that's valuable. You also want to make your points flow together. So like if I talked about the meaning of colors, right, for men and women, then I would say, hey, once you know your audience, here's the different types of colors you should be using for call to actions, right? I'm using transitions. I'm making things flow. You also want to use simple colors in your infographics. This isn't 1999 or the 80s where people are using neon signs and going zoom and zooming at you and stuff like that. No one wants to see that stuff. Keep your designs flat. Nothing fancy. The simpler it is, the more shares you actually get. And the more money you save. It's less design time. You also want to put your URL at the bottom and your logo. It'll help. help branding. Now, if you want to get your infographics made, there's a place you can go. I go to Dribbble. Have you guys heard of Dribbble? Don't look at the US. Go to overseas. Go look at all the foreign designs. You can pop out infographics for 500 bucks a pop. The U.S. people, they want like five grand, right? Although I love the U.S., I like the saving. So check out Dribbble. If you don't like uh, Dribbble or you can't find people, then check out 99designs. It's also another affordable place. Then I use Odesk, O-D-E-S-K. It's now the same company as Elance to get my infographic research done. $99. It's a good deal. $99 is a lot for them. And then when you do quantity, I do batches of four for $300. I get a $100 discount. Works out really well. <laughs> All that $100 adds up. Think about it. In five months, I just paid for extra infographic. See? Got to save. All right. So that's the Otis one. Now, when should you post your blogs? Do you know when you should post them? Right now, right? You think this is the best time? I don't know if you post it right now. I'm not reading it. You guys are reading it, right? So we found that Mondays at 11 a.m. That's the best time. This is EST. It works really well. Why is this time really good? What do people do on Mondays at 11 a.m.? That's right. They're at work, but they really are doing nothing. <laughs> they're probably waiting for lunch. I know I am. I'm like, oh, I'm hungry. I can't think. Let me just go browse the web and see what's around telling you, Monday, 11 a.m. works really well. People don't work that hard in corporate America. Some people do, but most people do not really work 40 hours a week. Also, when you're timing your emails, click-through rates, emails, right? Early mornings. Early mornings tend to get the most clicks. Why? 
Because what do people do right when they get into work? Well, well hopefully they're doing something, right? You can't be lazy right when you get into work unless you're hungover. Um, but you should be checking your emails. And if you email people during the morning, you're going to get more traffic. And if you email them roughly one to four times a month max, you will get the most clicks. I'm not saying you can't email them more, but the more often you email them, the less clicks and less opens you'll get per email. So when you're emailing, make sure you're only emailing good stuff. Anything that's crap, don't send it. You're just, you know, hurting your list. Social timing. Midweek, weekends, noon, and 6 p.m., right? Eastern time. Again, these are really popular timings if you're targeting a U.S. audience. Why? Because people during the middle of the day, at least in the Pacific Coast, right, they're just on social media like, all right, what are my friends up to? I know I'm at work. What's interesting? They're trying to get some entertainment out of life. That's when you should pop them with your blog post. Let them get some entertainment on your blog. Let them hit the buy button. When you do this and you're consistently awesome, you're going to get a ton of people tweeting at you, telling them, you know, telling you how they love you, love your content, love your business, etc. It really does work. In essence, you're just build, measure, and learning, right? That's what you're doing. So as you're doing the blogging, etc., use the lean startup methodology, the process to actually learn from your bloggers. What do they like? What do they don't like? Stop writing the stuff they don't want. Keep going from there. When you're doing all of this, you also have no reason to make money. I'm actually releasing a blog post, and it talks about January's traffic numbers. I think they're down from December. But it talks about how blogging generates direct sales. A lot of people think it doesn't, and I can attribute at least six figures in new monthly income from our corporate blogs. It's not bad. All from a channel that I think we spend five to 6000 We spent 5000 something for the month of January. And then we have to pay one person to manage all the blog spending, so his salary as well. But what does a person cost? Yeah, a good person is going to cost six figures, but it's not like you're paying a half a million. Right? The ROI and the numbers do pan out. So that's it. Any questions? Go for it. Any else? Okay. So, Neil, a quick question about uh, when you get to a certain size in traffic, um, did you face plateaus, and do you feel like there's ways to break through those plateaus? Uh, you do face them. Content quality is number one, so assuming the quality is high, and then you just have to go for quantity. You're going to hit a plateau unless you keep increasing the amount of content you publish. So with Kissmetrics, we had a plateau once we were publishing three times a week, and we did that for a month, and we are like, numbers aren't going up. Then we started publishing uh, five times a week. Numbers started going up. And then they started plateauing again after like eight, nine months. Now we're publishing almost 10 times a week. It works well. You'll, you can still increase. You'll see the growth from like Google and other sources. But when you're blogging like from five to 10, you can start seeing like double the numbers, which is huge. Because it typically means double the leads. I think from our blog, we accounted over 5,000 leads last month for people who are interested in enterprise software. Not bad, right? So if you're starting from zero, how do you get your blog started? Like, Do you have any other distribution channels in addition to Google? Do you post on message boards? So try to get there's a few ways. Bloggers? Number one, I use all social channels. So Facebook, LinkedIn, those are the best ways to actually gain traction. Two, LinkedIn groups. LinkedIn groups drive a ton of traffic. It's something that most people don't do. And all you have to do is just join the groups. You can join a lot of groups and submit your content. Most people won't accept the content that you submit, but a few will. It really does add up because some of these groups have like 600,000 members. That's 600,000 people that are potentially seeing your blog post, right? So that's way number one. Number two, if you have a company that you work at with a lot of employees, have them all promote your content. Sean, who manages our blog, get an email for every day. He's like, Please LinkedIn this. Please tweet this. And he's figured that you only asked for one channel, and he asked for the channel that he thinks is going to perform the best for that blog post. He started asking the whole company. I think we have like 60-something people. But no one does it when you tell them, hey, Twitter this and LinkedIn this. No one does it. But he picks one, and they do it. The other thing that we do is we go out there, and every time we link to people within our blog, column. So what's your name? Tom. So I'd be like, hey, Tom. What, what's your blog's name? Mor Morpheus. Hey, Tom, I just want to let you know, Morpheus is an awesome blog. I got so much value out of it that I actually linked to you in my latest blog post. 
I hope you're flattered by this. You've done so much for me. It's the least that I can do for you. Please check it out. And if you like it, feel free to share it. P.S. And that would be like, thanks, Neil. No, like, P.S. If you do share it, it'll make my year. Right? You know how many people actually share it? A lot. Now, I do ask you one thing from you guys. Don't send those emails to me. Because every time I give this speech, I get so many emails. of people are like, oh, we're going to send this. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to share it. And then some people started changing the emails of like, Neil, you've meant so much to me. I linked to you twice within my blog post, right? And they're like, it means so much if you share it. Sometimes they get me, but um, so that's another way. Then the last way that I like posts is I actually do guest posts. So if you hit up Forbes and sites like that, they already have the audience that you're but if you hit them up and you're like, I want to blog for you, Forbes, Fortune, it doesn't matter who hits them up. Even if I hit them up, they don't know who I am, right? They don't know who you are, and that's okay. But all these sites need content. What do they need content? Take a guess. That's right. It is ad revenue. More content equals more page views. More page views equals more CPMs, and they get high CPMs. And they don't pay their writers, like especially their contributors. They pay the editors and staff writers, but not the contributors. And contributors tend to produce more content for them. So, you've got to reach out to these contributors. So, let's say Tom here, again, blogs on Forbes. I'd be like, I would reach out to him and be like, hey, Tom, excellent article on Forbes. I got to say, I learned a lot from it. Your points on A, B, and C taught me about this. On a side note, have you ever thought about covering X, Y, and C? I noticed you didn't mention them within your blog post, but I think it would add a lot of value to your readers. Your fan, Neil. I love the your fan part. That works really well. I got it from Eminem. I don't listen to rap, but Eminem got me there. Your fan Stan is your fan Neil now. Okay, after the first email, he usually follows up with me. I'll wait three days in case he doesn't follow up, or even if he does, I usually wait three days. Then I'll email him again. And I'll be like, hey, I was just reading one of your old posts, and I noticed that uh, you know you talked about X, Y, and Z. And you actually uh, forgot to include A, B, and C, right? Something that they could have included that didn't. And then I'm like, by doing that, it would have been more thorough, and I bet more social shares. And I'm like, I'm not trying to critique you or trying to be uh, you know, negative or anything like that. I just love what you're doing so much. I just want the whole world to see what you're writing. And by doing this, you'll probably get more coverage on the social web. Your fan, Neil. <laughs> and then I'll wait a while to probably respond. And then I'll, I'll follow up like, hey, Tom, I know you're busy. <laughs> so I'll keep this email short. I think it would be, I want to actually do you a favor. You've done so much for me. I want to actually create an article for you. I want to actually write an article about A, B, and C topic, and I think it will provide a lot of value to, you know, Forbes and your audience, etc. But I know you're busy, and you probably don't have the time to write it. If you can just introduce me to your editor at Forbes, I'll gladly write it on your behalf and you know link to you and include you in there. And in most cases, 30% of the time, Tom's going to actually do the introduction. So it's just a pure numbers game. So on a random week, I have someone sending out a ton of these emails as me, right? And it adds up because after a while, I'm getting all these accounts, and then I can blog on Forbes, and it actually generates a lot of traffic right? because they have millions of visitors. And they usually work based off velocity. So the more social shares an article gets on Forbes or Entrepreneur within a short period of time, the more likely they are to showcase it on their home page. So you get all your friends to start promoting it within the first 10 minutes, there's a good chance you'll hit the home page. In addition to that, Leo from Buffer does a great job with this. Start guest posting everywhere like top 10 social media tools, top 10 analytics tools, top 10 tools for your startup. And include your company in that list. It drives a ton of signups because Forbes and Entrepreneur have so much authority, they rank everywhere on Google at the top. And that drives a lot of signups, like hundreds and hundreds a day. So that's how you get a blog popular. It takes a lot of work at the beginning, but it does work. Now, Tom, don't email me all that stuff. Don't use it on me. <laughs> Next question. Uh. I read your blog a few times, and uh, I have a question. Uh, what is the percentage of monthly visitors out of 800,000 you had last month converting in uh, customers? For example, we use Google Analytics, Mix Panel for the segmentation and cohort analysis. We do programming in database internally for like source ID, 
and for different uh, user co cohorts to see LTV. In uh, your blogs, seems like it's mostly for marketers, for like A-B testing marketers, Yeah, but you can do managers. the same thing for engineers or whoever. So yeah. typically you're going to look at, if, you're, if you have your funnels and everything optimized, you're going to get roughly 1% of your visitors to convert into leads or customers. And it may not sound like a lot, but it does add up. If you get to 30,000, 100,000 visitors a month, that 1% really does add up. Uh, so in a startup, uh, who should be doing the blogging? Should it be the founders? And, and, and then the same question is, and should you invite other people to blog? Uh, it should be anyone within your company who has the time. Founders does help if they can write. And the second one is invite as many people. More content, the better off you are, assuming the quality is exceptionally high. At Kissmetrics, the way we seeded the blog is, we found all the popular writers in our space, because they also typically had good social media accounts, and we paid them 100 bucks a post. And what are they going to do? They wrote the article. They're probably going to share it on their social media account. That's how we got our popularity when we started off. And we also did expert roundups. So uh, if you don't have the time to blog, Go email out like 100 people within your space. Just ask them one question and do a roundup post. And once you do the roundup post, you email them all saying it's live and then ask them to share it and you'll actually get quite a bit of social traffic. Thanks so much for all of your uh, good tips. They're great. Um, I was curious about um, in a post-Panda Hummingbird world, how important are in the content and targeting a specific keyword? Um, I have this conversations going back to my VP about the keyword we're targeting. Uh, wh what are your thoughts on that? So, um, you want to know what I say or what I do? <laughs> okay, so targeting keywords does work. And if you actually take like the keywords that you're somewhat ranking for, because you can use Google Webmaster Tools and show you all your rankings for your keywords on your website, and you start shoving in some of those keywords into the title after the post has been published, you'll start seeing your rankings shoot up. Uh, also, if you Google a key term that you're on page one for, if you scroll down to the bottom page of Google, you'll see related terms. If you sprinkle in some of those words, they're longer tail. Like if I rank for online marketing on page one of Google. So there's probably bottom of page one that says like online marketing jobs, etc. So if I sprinkle those keywords in, I'm going to start ranking for all those other terms too because it's longer tail terms, easier to rank for. So it does work. But when I write, I don't even think about keywords. I just write good content. And it just brings in traffic because I do all the other promotion stuff. And yeah, you can modify. And if I did the modifications to the title stuff, I'd probably get an extra few hundred thousand visitors a month. I just don't care to do that, but I love the writing part. So, but either way, it works, right? I don't do the keyword stuff, but I should. So I'm kind of a hypocrite, but <laughs> go ahead. In the first year of an app release, would you recommend focusing on building your credibility or going more for app downloads? Um, so you mean mobile? Yes. So for mobile, I haven't seen blogging work as the main channel. Web-based apps, it could drive a lot of business. I think it does. Uh, in mobile, help a lot. I would build up credibility and blogging not on your own if you have a mobile app, but instead I would just focus purely on guest posts and talk about like what kind of mobile app is it? Uh, weight loss. Weight loss. Uh, top 10 ways to lose weight. And then mention your app in one of those uh, list items. Usually number two or three does the trick. Don't do number one. It's too greedy. I would also do top 10 apps and tools to help you lose weight. All that kind of stuff. And I would just sprinkle them all over the web, like bodybuilder.com or weightloss.com. Like, I don't know who's in this space, but you get what I mean. It'll work well. And those guys are even easier to get articles written on and published. They're not as picky as Forbes, but they drive a lot of volume. Thank you. And you'll also find with that audience, 40 to 60% of their readers are on mobile. Perfect for you. Um, yeah, early on in your presentation, you um, kind of the press is powerful. Um, you kind of glossed over why other platforms may not be good and sort of jokingly talked about like Tumblr. Um, Do you work with Tumblr? A, no, no, but no, I have two. <laughs> I have two uh, two questions. One All is, right. um, first off, why do you think Tumblr is bad? And then secondly would be, if your website has broader needs than what a WordPress install can support, do you recommend uh, a custom kind of CMS and building your own kind of blogging channel through your own CMS? 
Okay, so you're, uh, the, let's go with second question first. The second question is, if you're looking for stuff that WordPress doesn't support, do you build your own CMS? Is that the question? Yeah, kind of. If, you're, if your website has broader needs than just like a, a WordPress install, you have to have some level of functionality and you can't get your blogging channel through that and you want it all unified. Does it make sense to invest in a CMS that can support a custom blog? No. In WordPress and then have an engineer modify WordPress. That's what we do. It's a much more cost-effective approach. The reason you don't want to use Tumblr is, one, there's not people building off the top of Tumblr. So we're trying to do a lot of monetization tricks, make it SEO friendly, doing like related post plugin to cross-sync your posts. It's hard to do that stuff on Tumblr because no one's building on top of it. So there's just not much flex. Also, when you want to monetize, there's limitations on what you can do. WordPress. You can do whatever you want as long as you're on WordPress.org, right? And to clarify, don't be on WordPress.com. Stick with .org. And just go from there, and you'll save quite a bit of cash versus if you pick another form, platform. Have you ever contracted Odesk for uh, um, just, you know, contracting bloggers? And if you did, so for what specific skill set would you look for? Yeah, so... Um, the thing with Odesk and Elance is there's a lot of Indians on there. Would you guys agree? And I'm Indian, but we're not good vloggers. I'll tell you that majority of them aren't because they're in India and like it's choppy. I do not recommend. Uh, go to jobs.problogger.net and go to craigslist.org. That's where you should find the bloggers. They're cheap there. They're good quality and they know what they're doing. You can get bloggers, the good ones, starting at 40 bucks a post. Uh, jobs.problogger.net net I don't know why they don't have .com but the job board is good um, so I, I'm curious how important diversity of content is um, so specifically if you've identified who your um, buyer's persona is you've identified six um, themes that you want to stick to We've been producing blog posts now for seven years, and we're finding that a lot of the content can be repetitive. What is your advice there, and, and how broad can you be? You had mentioned that it's important to be What topics? Related. What's your blog on? Um, video marketing, video, uh, animated video, um, storytelling. I, I could go on. Have you talked about testing videos and where to put the right call to action? Be testing as You've well. You've done as colors and... And you've talked about uh, the different approaches of submitting all your videos to each channel, like doing case studies on that kind of stuff, and which ones work better. We could better. do more case studies. You can do more <laughs> case <laughs> studies. <laughs> uh, have you broken down how to create video scripts, the psychology behind them, how to actually survey? Own brain science. Objections, etc. Yeah. So how much content have you created? How many posts? Like a thousand? Hundreds. Hundreds. Hundreds? Switch video, you're familiar with us. Oh, maybe. Switch video, yeah, yeah, I know you guys. <laughs> yeah. I think your founder hit me up. You guys like based in like, oh uh, yeah. <laughs> Andrew, is it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm good. I get like 400 emails a day too. So, so um, we're creating content the mark, but I, I often am concerned that it's just not diverse enough. Um, so I'm just curious if you have thoughts on that or if you just Yeah, just stick but to you guys, thing. so I've seen some of your content you still haven't covered all the niches because you guys are so expensive. The quality is good, but you guys are expensive. Like I haven't seen a lot of detailed blog posts on how to produce similar quality to what Switch Video is doing for pennies on the dollar, right? And if you broke down the whole process and taught people how to do it, yeah, you're going to get some people to do it without you. But you know what's going to happen? Humans are lazy, so you're going to get more people to pay you. There's a lot of creative content that you can end up doing, right? Like, I would actually do a whole breakdown, uh, the difference between videos, podcasts, infographics, and a few other things, right? And start doing case studies on which ones drive more traffic. And you can talk about different distribution channels, et cetera, right? You can do one on the tools you can use to distribute your videos. And yeah, you may have already done blog posts on that, but you probably haven't gone in-depth where you're breaking down a thousand words per tool to break down how to actually use it step-by-step and -step showing screenshots and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Okay. Uh, anyone, yeah. Okay. Hi. I have kind of a unique question. This is a brand new career for me, and it's kind of a big question, but I'm... All right, I'll try to give I'm, you a big answer. Yeah. <laughs> where do I start? Oh, uh, where do you start? Well, I mean, what, what would you think would be... What's your business? 
is uh, it's a holding company uh, that's really data privacy driven. So we invest in a number of startups that so you're focus. Like a VC? That's one of our areas. Yeah. What's the main one? The main one, there are a couple main ones. Uh, one of the main one is more like DRM, like content protection for OTT and TV I have no developers. idea what you just said. Sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm going to dumb it down. There you um, go. Fifth it grader. Is, uh, I didn't go to Stanford. One of, <laughs> hell no. <laughs> one of the, the main companies is called Express Play that uh, works with app developers and TV broadcasting companies to protect their content. So I would start doing blog posts on, okay, so first, wordpressblog.org. Uh, where do you guys host your website? Uh, we just moved over to Squarespace. Squarespace. Yeah. So Squarespace has a blogging platform. Yes. You can use them. All right. Even though they're not WordPress, it'll work. Okay. Um, and then start writing blog posts on, I would just start writing a handful, like how to protect your uh, data from being pirated. Uh, yeah, how much uh, how much money are companies actually losing from data piracy, et cetera? Okay. And you probably work for a big corporation? It's pretty big. How many people? Um, we're international, I think, in total, about 200. Got it. Um, so you're probably not going to have someone who's going to blog every single week? Nope. <laughs> so I wouldn't even put a blog on your own site. I would just do guest posts. Hit up Forbes and Entrepreneur okay. and just release content whenever you guys awesome. have time. There's no point in putting a blog out unless you're going to be consistent. Okay. Go for it. Someone pass over the mic to whoever. Do you um, promote your blogs in any way other than blog posts and contributed articles and uh, that sort of thing? Do you have a way of promoting them? Uh, just to the methods I mentioned earlier. It's so like emailing people out that I link to, from sharing on my own social sites, asking employees to, submitting to LinkedIn groups. It works. You don't need a ton. You just need a of those. Okay. Hi. Um, can you speak a little bit about LinkedIn? I sell professional business services, consulting services, salespeople, and I'm thinking LinkedIn is something I want to try, but you know there's it so works. many ways to do well or to overshare there. So what do you what do you suggest? Do you have a lot of connections on LinkedIn? Yeah, yeah, 1,500 maybe. Oh, uh, you're good. Yeah, just keep adding more. Okay. Um, <laughs> but what I would do is, I, if I were you, I'd actually start blogging on LinkedIn. On LinkedIn. Yes, because okay. that's where you're probably going to find a lot of your customers. And then you'll start noticing more messages in your inbox, and then you can start messaging back, like, oh, yeah, I also offer X, Y, and Z. I think, you know, I was looking at your business in these areas. If you just need some bit of free advice, let me know. And then when you give them a bit of free advice, you can also be like, yeah, I can also do a lot more. I have paid plans if you're interested. And then you already give them a little taste, right? Perfect. And they're more likely to buy them. So I try it out. Thank you. You're welcome. a little bit about how effective webinars have been for you to generate leads and customers? It's very effective. I released the numbers in my blog post tomorrow. I actually wrote it before I came. It was like 1,800 and something or 1,900 and something leads generated from webinars in the month of January. It's a lot of leads. We get a ton of leads from webinars. The trick with webinars is uh, we found that it converts better when they're opting into the webinar to actually put a little tick box to say, hey, click here if you want to be a lead, right, and follow up and try out our product. We used to have that tick box automatically checked, and then we found out the lead quality sucked because most people weren't interested, and then sales guys would be calling numbers that weren't interested, which costs you money, right? They weren't cheap. Now, with webinars, what you'll find is people love human interaction. When they get to know you, and through a webinar they feel they can, assuming you leave roughly half the time for Q&A, because it actually builds that bond, right? What it does is because they have that connection, they're much more likely to purchase because you help them answer the questions, you got to know them, etc. And if you're looking to, for people to be filled within your webinar, announce it a week ahead of time, use Facebook advertising to fill it up because you can do specific targeting, same with LinkedIn, and it's a great way to fill up all your seats. And also, GoToWebinar is a high webinar tool we found for like lead pages some reason people love that brand, they're more likely to join your webinar if it's on GoToWebinar than a random tool. I'm not saying that tool is better, I'm just saying people are more likely to join when you use it. That's from at least what we've seen when we tested. GoToWebinar. Hi, I was curious if you had any feedback on the um, blog platform through Wix.com? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> do you work at Wix? No. no. 
Uh, it's funny too because Wix just recently paid me to speak at their whole event in uh, Israel. Um, but Wix is not bad. I still use WordPress. <laughs> the problem with Wix is it's meant for businesses, mom and pops, who aren't going to create a big business. It's meant for that solo person who has like a few employees for that brick and mortar. It's not meant for that person who's trying to raise venture capital or create a big business. Wix itself is a big business because majority of the people aren't good for WordPress dot org, right? They can be on WordPress.com. But Wix is like a version to create a website and you can do a blog on there. It's just again not as powerful, not as flexible. So when they monetize, you're gonna be limited and you'll be lucky if you can convert point one percent of your visitors into customers on a Wix blog. Squarespace is a better option for corporations, larger corporations, but WordPress still is the best option because there's just more flexibility on what you can do to convert visitors and customers. Like on our Kissmetrics blog, we actually do Google authentication with a click of a button, like sign in with Facebook or sign up with Facebook, etc. We can do that because WordPress has a lot of plugins that have that functionality. You can't do that kind of stuff on Squarespace as easily or Wix. Uh, another question, can I ask you? You still didn't answer exactly. Uh, you said 800,000 visitors monthly, 1% conversion. Is it subscribers or uh, leads, those ones leads, that start leads, leads trial. trials? And then because from each there are sales. Is different. Each so company what is percent different. of them start, become payable? It varies, but it's well into the hundreds. Hundreds? Because the, the question is you always, you said, 1,000 start subscription, yes. I mean, uh, trial. For you, usually we pay $1 per uh, registration, so it's $8,000, then the question is, does it worth it? it? It's more than worth it. Why? Um, and when I say we're collecting that many customers, we're only able to follow up with around 2,000 of the leads. Not because the leads are bad, we just don't have enough sales reps. So uh, if I paid even $10, $20 a lead, even 30 it would still be profitable. Because is LTV and uh, RPU the LTV high? is extreme. Hundreds high. or thousands? In thousands. Thousands, okay. Quiet room, so I'll double dip. Um, All right. <laughs> so you mentioned plugins, um, and our, I, uh, I work for an online brokerage, and so we have a bit of a longer sales cycle. As far as content, so we're doing more long form educational content. What would you recommend to get people to read more than one post uh, from you know related plus post pl plugins? Related or? posts, uh, email opt in, so okay. offer them a free ebook or a course or some tips. And then drip them so every time you release a new blog post, you can email them with the link to that blog post. It's correct because most people don't use RSS. Like, how many people use Speedburner still? Like, yeah, you may have it on your blog, but how many of you guys actually use an RSS reader? Raise your hands. We've got a few of you. Yeah. How many of you check your emails? Pretty much all of you, right? Go for emails. When you're heading over to here, all right. When you're heading over to Odesk to find a freelancer to do your research for your, um, you know, infographics, what kind of a person are you looking for, and what kind of direction are you giving them? So we look for a data analytical person, like someone who is smart, a good storyteller, and we just ask them to provide data, like good researchers. We actually look for college students because college students typically have to do research, so they're used to it. And what we'll do is we'll go and hire like five or ten of them at one time. And then out of them, we'll see who's the best, and we just keep using that one person. That's our model. And we don't even give them $100. We test them out like the cheapest amount, like 30 bucks or whatever. And you're like, whoever does a good job, we accept the work, we'll give you like extra 70 I know growth uh, hack marketing is mostly for startups and companies wanting to raise VC. But have you ever I encountered a brick and mortar that has used the platform very successfully? For blogging or For both. Uh, brick and mortar, yes. Uh, I've seen quite a few. I'm trying to think of this pool company. There's this Australian company 
and they actually do like crazy pictures of pools and how they build them. There's a kitchen cabinet company based out of New York who also is a really popular blogger. They have an extremely popular Facebook uh, kitchen page. I wish I knew their name. And all they do is just show cool pictures of kitchens. They're popular on Pinterest as well. And they'll write blog posts on how to do it. Like they even release this one picture where there's a fish tank within the kitchen. Like, oh, that's pretty cool, right? And it helps them get business and high-end business. And it's converting extremely well for them. Now, the thing with most brick and mortars is unless you're in an industry where it's sexy or appealing, for it to work, right? Like if you're selling piping, right? I don't know what you can write on piping, right? Like here's how to prevent your house piping from not rusting. Like, <laughs> I'm like, I don't care. It's in the ground. I don't see it anyways, right? But again, it works for some brick and mortar assuming it's like sexy enough. Do they usually close the sale online? Because it's not as direct in terms of path to purchase versus like a tech company. It is. They do it online. Just like now, if you look at brick and mortar businesses, like even restaurants, they're doing stuff where you get a free food item or you get a discount if you tweet something or you Facebook. Why? Because we are humans. Although we live in an offline world, all of us spend our time online. So it's like just marketing different channels. Got it. Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah, I have tried to create viral content. In the B2B world, it's really tough. It's just not sexy enough. Um, in the consumer-facing world, I used to be a consultant. I used to have a ton of viral content. Like, I created a post for a life insurance company called, like, the 19 things you didn't know about death, right? <laughs> And it's like, did you know when someone actually passes away, like they're alive, I think, for another like 10 or 15 seconds? So like you can actually say something to them and they'll hear you, right? It's kind of creepy, but like it's a real fact. So I don't know how I came up with that fact or figured that out, which is a different story. But nonetheless, consumer-based viral content is much easier if you write like crazy out there like type of topics like that. And that was for a boring company, life insurance. It's just how creative are you? You can use BuzzSumo, B-U-Z-Z, Sumo, S-U-M-O. Type in a keyword. It'll show you all the content that went viral within that subject matter. I'm not saying copy it, but try to create similar types of things based on what's done viral. Just to follow up on that, um, so do you think that other people, so like if you're not like inherently creative, Yes, if you're not creative, go find the people who are creative and hire them. Because what makes the best marketers aren't people who are most analytical or, you know, got a degree in marketing. It really comes down to who's the most creative. That's what I found out that is the most successful marketer, especially like in blogging and inbound and all that kind of stuff. And Neil, um, just in general in terms of content marketing, who are some other people or companies who you think do an awesome job as well and that you respect or look up to? It's funny. Most of the companies that I know that are doing well are B2B companies in the marketing world because <laughs> they're usually the pioneers, right? Moz is doing an exceptional and good job. HubSpot is doing a good job. Upworthy is doing a good job, right? Their analytics does help, right? Like they're thinking about numbers and data points. Uh, it does well. I would say those are some of the ones that do exceptionally well. analytics for your app, things like that. But I feel like the inherent, the keywords I'm using, because the industry is so niche, there's not inherently enough search volume for it. So I'm not getting that. Are you writing them on your own site? Yeah. That's why. If you wrote those articles on Entrepreneur and Forbes, you would generate a lot of traffic. Because so so a I lot of people want to learn about the app stuff, mm -hmm. and Entrepreneur and Forbes will rank, outrank you by far. and They'll get to the top really quickly for all those terms. And yes, it may not be as popular as you want right now. Give it another year or two those pages will still rank, and mm -hmm. you'll be getting residual traffic from those old blog posts. I feel like the pages are ranked already, at least the ones I'm targeting, but because there's not enough people searching for that specific stuff, there's not enough traffic coming in. So I'm starting to do content syndication now on like business to community and like social media today, but I'm not sure whether whether yeah. we have uh, ready to go that to That means you're not, 
you should write more generic stuff too, more broad end. How to create an app for your business, mm -hmm. right? Because a portion of those people are also developers, so go more broad. Also for the keywords that you're targeting, you can target those keywords on Entrepreneur, Forbes, your own blog, and a few others. So then you take up the number one, two, three, four, five, six mm -hmm. listing, right? Which helps. I would also start creating presentations, slide share, and sites like that get probably hundreds of millions or you know millions of whatever the number is visitors each and every. Mm -hmm. Creating presentations on app development, etc., will help too. Okay. Uh, also, create a LinkedIn group on app development, and then you can publish the latest insights. To help get more business as well. Just to add, I actually had a very unique situation with the LinkedIn group. I used to publish all my posts on like the few like top five groups that were pertaining to the audience I was trying to reach out to. There is something called Swam in LinkedIn, which is like site wide something moderation, where basically one of the LinkedIn group members thought that this content is not it's like spam because you just you just posted a blog post and they they kind of audited me so i was i was blocked across all blo yes. all uh, groups for a while and i wasn't sure why I, and i i didn't know which one blocked me and why they blocked me it's but typically content quality mm -hmm. so they're looking at how detailed and thorough your blog post mm -hmm. is if it's not thorough enough that's probably why you're getting flagged okay. they all what other sites are you submitting if you're just submitting your own to all the groups and you're not mm -hmm. submitting other people's then okay. they're like this guy's person or this lady is just self promoting okay Looks like no more questions. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you, Neil, very much. And thanks, everyone. And hope to see you another time.